What up, my sprudes and spruettes? My name is Scott. And I'm John. And welcome to the Trapped Under Plastic podcast, the podcast for the miniature hobby enthusiast that comes out every other Monday that you can find on all places where you can find podcasts. Yeah, yeah, baby, podcasts. So I feel like since our last episode, like, We've we've gone through this like transformational journey mm. of two episodes, so now we know everything. Yeah, we're pro- po- we're professionals at this for sure. Yeah, so let's because we like being transparent with the sprudes and spruettes. Yeah, um, so let's talk about the things that we have learned before we get into the meat and potatoes of the episode. <laughs> okay. um, first things first. We're going off script here, and I'm scared. Yeah. Oh, well, you know, you know, just flying by the seat of my pants. <laughs> first and foremost, we're gonna try to. We're going to do our darndest to cut down on the swears. Yes. John and I, we, we grew up on a pirate ship. Yes. Um, and so we like to swear a lot. But we're going to try to cut that out. That's a good point. Yeah. I mean, they weren't the same pirate ship. We like had the same trade routes, though, through the Bering Sea. And so like we'd pass each other and be like, hi, bye. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What was your captain's name? Uh, Long Finger. <laughs> <laughs> what was your captain's name? I was going to say something normal like Blackbeard. <laughs> oh. <laughs> You went with the long finger. <laughs> he had this one really creepy long finger. Okay. Yeah. Just longer than everything else. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. What? So you're going to go with Blackbeard? Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm normal. Okay. All right. So, so yeah, we're going to try to keep the swears down, but like in a organic way. <laughs> yeah. If we get heated talking about some garbage GW release, yeah, it's going to fly. I, I can't promise anything, you're especially correct. if it's Wood Elf related. Yeah. I mean... Uh, we want to be respectful of those that that l- listen to us while they're doing their hobby and, and you know if you're a kids running around in and out of your room and stuff mm-hmm. we don't want to be talking about long fingers and <laughs> yeah no no one wants to hear about that but we're also going to try to whisper less yes we whisper a lot yeah what well, one of the episodes the second episode the first episode first episode we whispered so much and i blame these microphones yeah they yeah they're so good yeah i just want to whisper into it see yes. i did it already all right, getting back on task here. The first thing we do in this podcast is touch the mic less because I keep oh, doing God. that. And also, we discuss what we've painted in the last two weeks. John, why don't you kick us off? What I've painted. Um, okay, I finished up the season two warbands for Warhammer Underworlds uh, commission. What was that, that called? Is it called like Night Vault? Uh, Night Vault was the starter for season two. Okay. Or, ooh, maybe that's Nightfall is all of them? Crap. Because the first one's Underworld Shadespire. Yeah. And then everyone called it Shadespire. And yeah. like GW was like, no, that's not the name of the game. The name of the game is Underworld. And I was like, maybe you shouldn't have put Shadespire in gigantic <laughs> font on the box. Yep. Um, and Underworlds is just kind of like, I mean, it brought to you by Underworld. Yeah, it's like it's like, <laughs> it's like the little Kellogg's logo. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I think season two is called Nightfall. Yep. And yep. then season three is called Beast Grave. Beast Grave. Beast Grave. Yeah. And it's the most badass combination of things where they're just like, let's mishmash two like nerd words together. Yeah. Beast yeah. Grave. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. It's seemingly unrelated things. Yeah. yeah. It's like the same. It was like designed by the same guy that came up with the names of the Saturday morning cartoons characters. <laughs> it's just like, what? <laughs> Bonesaw. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Hey, that's actually a character in, in Guild Ball. Bonesaw? My my striker's name is is uh, Bonesaw. Bonesaw is Ma- Racho, Macho Man Randy Savage's character in the original Spider-Man movie. Wait, Macho Man Randy Savage was in the original Spider-Man? Yeah, yeah, the one with Tobey Maguire. Are you serious? Yeah. He oh, was... oh, oh, he's the wrestler yeah. in the beginning. Are you serious? Yeah. His name is... Really? Yeah, his name is Bonesaw. That's awesome. Well, Bonesaw is also a real thing. It's a surgical weapon. A uh, surgical uh, instrument. You <laughs> literally saw bones with it, like when you're amputating someone. Oh, that's where it gets a name from. Right. It's not it, that is. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Whereas beast grave is just a mishmash of two nerd terms. Right. Yeah. Yeah. What's hilarious is that the second word is grave, but there's no like undead in that box. No. Nope. It's beast man, beast, and it's like elf centaur people. Yeah. Grave. It, it's like. How can we make elves more like beastmen? And then it's like kind of somewhere in, in between. Oh, so this is, it, it's like evolution. It's showing the evolution. Which makes no sense because like what elves hate beastmen because beastmen are like the main antagonist to the forest. So like they're becoming more like them. 
Oh. But we're off topic here. <laughs> this has nothing to do with what I painted. Right. That's what, okay. Yeah. Right. I, I painted those things. So I I uh, did all of the season one war bands and all the season two war bands. That's significant. There's a lot of freaking minis. Yeah. Let's, let's back up. How many minis is that? I have no idea. It's like there's six like, war bands? More than that. Eight. I think there's eight. Um, so there's eight per season. So yep. that'd be 16 war bands. I would say you average like four and a half models per war band. Some have three, but then goblins had like nine. Yeah. So it's like 30, 40 models. Yeah. It was a lot. Um, but I, I work with my monochrome scheme to try to color test, um, with speed and adding contrast while keeping it monochrome and not letting the highlights just get to saturation desaturated i should say because mm-hmm. a lot of times if if you're just like building up uh colors and you want it very like monotone you'll just keep adding white okay and then the highlight colors aren't really popping yeah you know and this reminds me in a previous episode of the podcast i said i think this is actually the extended version of the podcast i said that brightness and saturation are at ends with each other Mm -hmm. when you when you boost the brightness you kind of lose the contrast and i think an important distinction that i need to make is that this is true when you're painting with pigments because pigments are like subtractive Mm -hmm. if you actually are using like light real light um when things get brighter they don't get desaturated that was a a thing that only applied to painting you know what i'm talking about yeah i get what you're saying right okay cool then you're kind of dealing with the chemistry at that point of the medium of what you're working with right right okay i I totally agree so i i knocked those out i had this system where i go to menards or home depot or whatever and i go and get a handful of uh their painting stir sticks oh like the big like ruler stick long ones because okay. they're free. Yeah. Right. I go and get them and then I um, blue tack down the whole war band onto one of them. Mm-hmm. And then I can airbrush. Is this, It's like a giant painting handle. Yes. And I can airbrush the whole things and kind of, it's so much quicker to Wait, do that. I have a question about this. So like you go into Home Depot, those stir sticks aren't, they're not out somewhere. Yeah. You, just you have to ha- go you have and to lie. the lady for stir sticks. Yeah. You lie. What do you say? What does the conversation look like? Uh, first of all, you need to put paint on your clothes oh oh so it's like mid house project yeah like are oh. you serious do you do this no I don't oh do my that. gosh that would be amazing they don't give a sh- one time there was oh, oh there's the first swear there it is um quarter s- in the swear jar swear jar but you just i've actually went in there and there's nobody at the counter desk thing and i just <laughs> walked behind it and took them you like, serious? i don't care anymore <laughs> Like, Hold on. At a certain point, you should have enough stir sticks. You don't need any more. Are you just like f- just destroying these after each project, like lighting them on fire, or breaking them in half? It's like I, ceremonial for you. <laughs> no. What happens to them? Uh, I don't know where they go, actually. <laughs> They're probably somewhere in my basement. You probably have like 500 yeah. <laughs> it's like stashed away somewhere. Yeah. Sometimes they get all like goopy with paint and stuff. And uh, when I use them, I usually will toss them after I use them with rattle can. Why? I don't know why. They still, they'll still. I hate the environment. Okay, they'll still <laughs> work, right? I mean, yes, technically they'll work, Scott. Okay, okay. Well, well, actually, when I put the the sticky tape down, because I I buy like the super cheap sticky tape for this mm-hmm. double sided sticky tape, and I just run a a line over the whole thing, right? And once I can't like stick the minis to it anymore because there's too much paint from overspray, then I toss it. You take the tape off and you put new tape on top. There you go. Now you don't need to go to Home Depot ever again. <laughs> Unless you're there for actual house Act, supplies. Right. <laughs> yeah, I think that lady's catching on to me at this point. <laughs> yeah. This guy doesn't have this many rooms in his house. What's going on? He's never bought paint here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he is. He's come away with about 80 stir sticks. <laughs> I get the paint from Menards and then get the stir sticks from Home Depot. Yeah, like, you guys get the primo stir sticks. Yeah, like, yeah, it's made out of pine instead of that other garbage that Menards uses. Just wet cardboard. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you painted some Underworld stuff. Yeah. Uh, the, so entire, I, the entire yeah, game. I cranked that out and then I have started working on golden demon 2020 work which no no painting yet but my i have a a project that i'm quickly understanding how much work and 
and that I'm probably not going to do it. But I, I you're, what? You're not going to do it? I, well, I mean, I'm gonna. I don't know. I I need to just start. But it's, so it's a diorama. So there's a lot involved in it, and I don't like talking about it because that I feel like it commits me to something that I have about seven percent optimism that i can pull off so okay so you're hedging right now yeah yeah okay so yeah. if this never comes to fruition and i never do this piece you guys are just like yeah i'm no i don't care if you didn't do it right yeah okay so he's not he's not verbally committing to it but mm -mm. i think deep down inside yeah. you're gonna feel like you committed a little bit yeah oh yeah i have all my sketches as designed out what it's gonna look like and you, how it logistically what? works seriously yeah Show me. It's in. It's it's beyond your capabilities. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Wait, are you scared if you're going to show me? I'm going to like compete with you or something? No, that that you'll say it's stupid. Oh no, I'm not going to tell you what. No, you yeah. have good taste. You, it'll be good. Okay, I think I've talked about it before. Maybe I haven't. Um, and I also have. I bought a box of miniatures that I'm not going to say what they are, and I started. Um, tearing them apart so I can repose them all. Let me just guess what they are. Does it start with an S and end in a Marine? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Going for that W, ladies and gentlemen, John Ninas, uh, yeah. painting the Space Marine. Hey, it's like the second Space Marine I'll have ever painted. I mean, that's tech okay. Yeah. You got me beat there. So, yeah. Anyway, that's what I painted. What did you paint? Okay. Um, speaking of Space Marines, I did a little speed painting trial. There's this guy that I uh, follow on Instagram. His name is Arnau Lazaro. And he's been posting these things. Normally he paints display miniatures and he's he's very good at painting busts. Um, and recently he's been painting what he's calling his 30 minute uh, space marine projects where he'll paint, I don't know, like the claim is that each dude takes 30 minutes or less to paint. Do you believe that? Um, I don't think he's timing it. Uh, I think it's kind of like a, I'm getting close to 30. Roughly. But yeah, but I took it as a challenge. I was like, how, how, how possible is this? Can I, can I paint a space marine in 30 minutes? Like for me, an hour and a half is like a good speed paint. Mm -hmm. So I was like, can I triple that speed? Um, so I set out with, I bought a box, 15 bucks of the three Primaris Reavers because I couldn't find the normal space marines locally. And I wanted to shoot this video really fast. So I found the three box of primary space Marines at fancy fight game center, um, nearby. And I, uh, wrote down a little scheme and tried to speed paint them under 30 minutes. Now I didn't time the cleaning of the, of the brush or like putting paint on the paint pad. I only timed active time painting. And my reasoning for that was if you were batch painting this, the things that would take the most time would be the application of paint, not like the cleaning stage or like the, kind of like the dead time. So I just wanted to see how long it would take me if I actually was only painting. And I oh, got pretty oh, close. Oh, so you're saying if you're doing 10 or 20 of them, if it takes you two minutes to clean out your airbrush between colors, it takes you two minutes regardless if you did one or did 20. It's a constant, yeah. 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 And in this trial, that's a large percentage of the time. Mm -hmm. But in in a trial where I'm painting 10 or 20 of them, that that percentage, you know, is shrunk down a yep. lot. I get it. Um. So... I got pretty close. I think my timings were like 35, 42, 33, something like that for a first, second, and third attempt. Um, what I discovered was seemingly identical steps would take wildly different times hmm. in identical miniatures. And I'm not sure why that happens. Like you think that the painting, the black belt step in stage one would be identical to stage two, but yeah. it wasn't, it was like, it was like two minute different, which was kind of big. Like if, if you have like 15 steps, each step taking two minutes is 30 minutes, right? So it's mm -hmm. like, you really are trying to crunch down seconds here and you're trying to yeah. go as fast as you can. Um, so yeah, it was like, why is there such a disparity here? That was kind of an interesting thing that I, that I noticed. Maybe that's just an example of like how unrefined the, the, the process is still. Mm -hmm. And like the, the more I did that specific process, the faster I'd get. But it was, even though I didn't get under 30, it was still encouraging. It was like, this is actually kind of a fun way to figure out how to paint a rank and file a troop for an army mm -hmm. is to try to speed paint them under 30 minutes. So I might try to do that with something, you know, that I own. So that I, I did three Primaris Reavers, tried to paint them as white scars because I felt like that was appealing because I've never painted a white Marine on my channel before. So I decided to do that. 
Um, and then the other thing I painted was a Warcry figure. So GW sent out some of their unmade dudes, and I painted one up for kind of more of a weathering-focused video and uh, had a lot of fun with that, making it look gritty and dirty. So do you like the Warcry sculpts? I haven't had my hands on those to see, like, what's the quality of the plastic and all that stuff is pretty pretty good. I mean, it's a Games Workshop plastic miniature. They're all amazing. Yeah. I think Games Workshop is untouchable when it comes to 32 millimeter scale plastic sculpts. Oh, yeah, you're you're probably right. Is someone better? No, I, oh no, not even close. I feel like Malifaux is the second closest, but they're not they're not at that level in terms of detail. Mm. They're they're there for terms of number of pieces oh, per model. Yeah, buddy. Holy cow. <laughs> Yeah, and then adding insult to injury, they're also like true scale. So like when you get a miniature who has a true scale hand where the fingers are one part and the knuckles and the, the fist are the second part, oh. it's like, what are you doing to me here? Oh my God. That happened to me. I was like, this it's insane. Absolutely insane. Um, our, our Kingdom Death plastic? Okay, yeah. Close? They got to be close. Yeah, I would say you're right. You're right. Those, those are pretty close. So... Is it multi-pose kit like Necromunda or is it no, like no. it's just monopose? Just monopose and, you know, I'm kind of okay with that. Um, well, I guess someone who's more of a converter would be like not okay with that. But holy cow, dude, assembling a Necromunda guy takes forever because there are <laughs> so many bits. Like his bicep, his forearm, his like quad, like they're all separate pieces and they're just, it's, it's tough. At a certain point, it's too overwhelming to really like want to take advantage of all the opportunities. You're like, I just want to build it. And uh. yeah, I guess it depends. Like if you enter into like buying a Necromunda squad with the thought that I'm buying this for bits for conversions, like it's a gold mine, right? But if you just want a squad just to paint them, it's, it's definitely a burden. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I, I mean, there's some part of me that's like holding out on the, this is showing that GW is not going 100% monopose kits is the necromunda outlier there yeah absolutely you know i mean like if you buy a box of like standard primaris dudes that aren't the easy to build like yes they aren't monopose but that just means that all their poses are basically the same yeah because they have to work within this like a much smaller window of movement in limbs and body okay because you can't have a dude like doing a somersault on his back and have be able to interchange the different bits with that versus the guy that's laying on his belly and shooting his sniper rifle. Like, no, oh, okay, you right. know, like they're, they're so, okay, yeah. In an in an effort to provide a variety of of sculpts to the end user who maybe isn't so good at converting or modifying, they are limiting the uh, like how general each bit is and in, in what each bit can be used in what conversion. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, they want the end product to be cool for everyone, even if you're not good at converting. And that means having cool poses like the guy lying down with the sniper rifle and then yeah. the guy tossing a grenade and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah like the Warcry guy that you bought or you painted. Sorry, you didn't buy it. <laughs> <laughs> that, you, that you painted for your video. He's like running headfirst, like Naruto run kind of thing. He's got, yeah, he's got that anime run going on. Yeah. Sure. And that... That is awesome because that kind of pose was not doable by even GW like five years ago. Yeah. Because they, with a 3D sculpting that they're doing, plus really committing to a standard mono pose, it allows them to be more dynamic. So, you sure. Know. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and all those limbs are like super straight. And so you yeah. could, you know, rotate them or, or, or do something else with yeah. them if you wanted to. Yeah. All right. Anything else you want to talk about in terms of what you painted? Uh, nope. I don't. Like, I'd say this, though, now that this is episode three, like... Episode three. Right? Like, I I have, like, this little bit of, like, a single bead of sweat that comes down my head randomly sometimes. Not right now. Okay. Like, when I'm like, now I'm crap, I got to paint. I got to make sure I paint more stuff because I got to talk about it in the podcast. Yeah. You can't have a week off. No. And you're like, oh, crap. I, I got to make sure I'm doing something. So, maybe that should be a challenge. Should okay. we say that at this point of the podcast, each episode, you, everyone that's listening has to go in their head and say, since the last episode, what did I paint? Oh, yeah. I like that. Challenge yourself to keep on a, on a two-week track. So, yeah. Imagine you're a co-host in here. 
And you, you know, what did you paint in the last two weeks? Let us know. You can say in the comment section um, of a YouTube video or, or comment other, other places. Actually, you know what? If you're an audio listener, there is no place for you to comment, right? I know. That's a bummer. That's kind of a bummer. Maybe we should have a Facebook page. Oh, you think so? I, like, I think that's kind of a good idea. I like the more um, historical um, referencing of a Facebook page as opposed to a Discord server. Maybe that's just me. Sure. Because like, if I wake up and there's like 82 pages of Discord conversation, I feel like I either have to read it all or I don't want to read any of it. Mm. Yeah, I like that idea. Um, let us know if you guys want to give that a shot and we can kind of consider setting something up for for that kind of like almost like an accountability program for painting managers right <laughs> yeah we could have that as part of the facebook page where you share like your pictures of your every two weeks too yeah there's like a community tab yeah uh, i like, like it that. okay cool so. um so the topic for this week um is is airbrush cheating and it's that kind of we're going to explore a larger question around that kind of more simple question um, and I think John's going to ca- kind of carry this conversation a little <laughs> bit. Get on my backpack. <laughs> your backpack? My, my Get in my, your backpack? Yeah. I was trying to say in on my backpack. That's very hard to say fast. Backpack. Maybe for you it is. <laughs> 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 All right. So you have a way you want to break down this conversation, right? Yeah. I, I think so. I, I think... I mean, the question is airbrushing cheating was just kind of the basic form of, of the question, but I think we're going to go into to some more depth and some variations of that. But I think that's the the logical starting point for this. So we hear it, you see it, people say it. We've all heard somebody say it. Maybe we feel it's true, maybe we don't. Airbrushing is cheating or some iteration of that that phrase or that notion. Mm -hmm. Airbrushing is easy mode, right? Or airbrushing doesn't require any skill or airbrushing is just not fair i don't know you right right yeah yeah that that's that's the impetus for the question because people that don't have an airbrush that might see a result that looks pretty good for a, a low time investment might be like well is that is that a paintbrush or is that an airbrush it's like why, why do you care to to differentiate between the two it's like mm. there, there's a feeling that people might get where it's like, okay, I'm validated that, that that was an airbrush because in my mind, that person couldn't achieve that same result with a paintbrush. Yeah. You know, it's it's a kind of like a little competitive thing. Okay. So to start this off, I think the question we need to first explore is why do people say airbrushing is cheating? And I think you can't, well, you alluded to one possible answer there is that it looks too good. What do you mean by it looks too good to be done with a brush? Okay, so I mean the only thing that I think of when people think airbrushing is cheating is just that you are able to get a seamless blend with little time invested. And oftentimes it looks most impressive when it's on a big piece of something, yeah. like a big seventy five millimeter person's robe or like an armor panel on like a tank or something like that. The bigger the thing, the more impressive the blend is looks the more colors used the more impressive it looks so it's just like if you were to do that with a brush at least if i were to do that with a brush i would have to labor over that for a long time um and it, with an airbrush you can get it in a fraction of the time uh and pretty much i don't know like 85 percent, 90 percent of the the result with yeah like a 10 percent of the time maybe yeah i i think that it most shows itself in large geometrical shapes geometric you mean like squared off things yeah okay. i mean typically what where we see this is like armor panels on like dreadnoughts or, yeah dreadnoughts or rhinos or land speeders land rovers land <laughs> land rovers what's the land thing uh in 40k uh, the the flying thingy with uh, i have land speeder sure yes i don't know for sure or just because you know we're not gonna we're not only 40k players uh, what's the thing in in, in war machine they called war hounds war jacks war jacks yes which is a really badass word it i is. like saying that that's kind of another thing where it took two nerd words and put them together they did yeah, jacks isn't really a nerd word but yeah it's like war jacks dragon blade <laughs> you know we're just coming up with great ones here. <laughs> okay. dragon blade <laughs> fire hound <laughs> yeah there you go <laughs> let's start a mantra company we can do this all day <laughs> uh cantor blue oh oh no, that, that doesn't work already. No. 
Okay. That's just taking a character's name from your game. A character's name? Yeah. Cantor? Is Benjamin it? Cantor is a real person. Yeah, but Cantor is something from 40K, too. I know Ben is a real person, but... Oh, Pedro Cantor. He is, uh, like, a captain for uh, the Crimson Fist or something. Yeah, exactly. Oh, that's right. He is Pedro. He is a Crimson Fist dude, because I had that one guy that wants me to paint him, and I had to I had to ask, like, the noob question of, like, who is that? <laughs> and he's like, Pedro Cantor. I'm like, that's funny. They wouldn't you call somebody Pedro in the 40K universe. He's like, they did, and he's really important. I'm like... Well, I feel like an idiot. <laughs> Pedro it is. Yeah, so we're talking about big stuff, right? Because that's, it, when you're thinking about like two brush blending or you're talking about even feathering um, or glazing, if you got a big old armor leg panel on a Titan or something, that sucks to do with the paintbrush. It does suck. And like, especially if it's like rounded because like doing a circular blend is so much harder than doing like a top down blend mm -hmm. it's like wet blending makes it pretty easy you kind of just like yes you just yep. you just flap that paintbrush back and forth and it kind of works but like if you gotta do a circular thing way harder <laughs> you gotta master the corkscrew yeah <laughs> <laughs> you have to make that sound while you do it or it doesn't work out very okay, well yeah, i agree i agree um so people say oh you know that it just was easy because you could do it that way and and it is and it isn't i mean it requires understanding and experience and practice with that tool, mm -hmm. just like it requires those same three things with the paintbrush. Mm -hmm. It's just that, well, I see this and it looks great, so it must have been an airbrush. Yeah, yeah. And then that somehow devaluing the paint job. So, yeah. Yeah, so, I, yeah, one thing John started to say was that it's not as easy as it seems. I mean, for some people, it seems like it is, but my journey to using an airbrush was not as advertised. <laughs> no. Um, I had a, a, a large amount of trouble with speckling when I first started in, in figuring out the right amount of pressure and the right dilution for the paint. That's kind of, that's kind of the magic thing. You yes. need to figure out the dilution and the pressure to use. And it's not always the same. It changes. No. If you're going for coverage and you don't care about spottiness, you go thick paint, you go high pressure. If you're trying to make something more subtle, you go thinner paint and maybe, maybe a lower pressure. Um, it's different based on what you're trying to do. And that nuance is very similar to painting with a brush right. and like how much dilution you're going to use based on what you're painting, what paint range you're using, what you're trying to do. So I don't know, maybe some people had a really easy time using a paintbrush and you can talk about that for you. But for me, it took me like, I want to say like a year to kind of really kind of figure out what I needed to understand. Yeah, I and I think it's a it's a never ending thing. It's just like w with opening a new bottle of paint and mm -hmm. figuring out how that works. Mm -hmm. I'm still the same way with an airbrush, where I'm never really all that confident that when I set my PSI to 25 and I put this in with three three drops of thinner and one drop of flow improver and I mix it up and I pull back on the trigger. I'm not a hundred percent certain how it's going to go. <laughs> yeah. It could be speculative. Yeah. yeah. You never really know. Yeah. I, um, I, I, I think it's, it's one of those things where it's a math equation where you don't always know what every variable is prior. Yeah. I think it's kind of dangerous to, I don't know. I mean, for yourself personally, you can kind of figure out like, okay, three drops of thinner for three drops of white ink in my specific setup. But people at home are kind of using, different paints, different ages of paints. So trying to uh, equate it to a formula is a little bit different. I think the best way is to kind of figure it out by feel. Mm -hmm. And one way that I would figure it out by feel is when I have the paint in my, my paint cup and it's kind of mixed up, I'll take a paintbrush, you know, I'll paint it up the side of the cup and then I'll watch how fast it runs back down into <laughs> the paintbrush cup. Mm -hmm. And then like, but depending on how viscous it is, it'll run faster or slower. And then I'll kind of get an idea for, for how thick and thin it is. And then I'll spray it onto my black glove that I'm wearing because I wear black gloves now because my wife reads YouTube comments and she's scared I'm going to get hand cancer. <laughs> Does she know <laughs> that there's no such thing as hand cancer? No, but like the general notion is, your skin is porous and it absorbs what you put on top of it. So it's just like, if you can avoid it, 
why not put a glove on and just not have your skin absorb acrylic paint? Like whatever. Maybe it's harmless. Who knows? But I'll spray it on my black glove and then I'll see, okay, it's a little bit speckly. Maybe add some more water, increase the pressure, whatever. Um, but yeah, I think we're kind of going off the rails here of the question, is airbrushing cheating? There are no rails. We are not bumper bowling today, my friend. Okay. So let's talk about horror movies then. Okay. No, it's good. Um, I, want, I want to touch on something really quick. Touch in, it. In, re- <laughs> in relation to what you just said. In a previous episode, we talked about Angel Geraldes having a new YouTube channel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I watched a video of his recently okay. where he is airbrushing white white cloth okay okay also tie into a previous uh podcast topic he was painting an assassin's creed figure yeah that i don't think was officially licensed by the Assassin's creed oh no so anyway um he uses a dry palette to mix all his paints for his airbrush before he puts them in the cup yeah yeah it's like it's like a clamshell sprue and so he'll mix it and then he'll pour it into the paint the airbrush, right? Yeah. Yeah. And why that just boggled my mind, and maybe I'm the only person that like was blown away by seeing that he does that, there's two reasons. One, he is like an airbrush master. So whenever he does something that I assume is related to that master class, I assume that makes it a best practice. Okay, yeah. That version, that way to do it is the best way to do it. Yeah, because if he's doing it, he arrived there after testing other things and finding out that, okay, this is lacking. I need to try something else. And Yes. Yeah. Whereas most of us mix the colors right in the cup. Right in the cup. Yep. And you do the old backflow, plug the cap and let it go. Yep. And then that mixes it. It's good. Yeah, it works. Okay. So that that thing surprised me. Oh, I. you know why I think he does that? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, I experimented with a Harder and Steenbeck airbrush. I'm pretty sure he uses the Infinity. He does. Which is the Harder and Steenbeck brush, right? It's like their, yeah. it's their kind of expensive one. Yeah. It's like 300 or something. Um, that airbrush, the cup has a long snout to it. What I'm, cause it's oh. interchangeable cause you can, which is cool. But the downside is, is when you use a small amount of paint, it gets lost in this narrow tunnel at the bottom. And it's like, I can't really see what I'm doing. Cause all I see is this tiny circle of paint, which is like, there actually is a decent amount of paint in there, but since it's kind of like a long narrow tunnel until it starts to like balloon out into the actual cup itself, you need to put so much paint in there before you can actually start mixing and getting an idea for what it looks like. So maybe that's that's why he does it. Mm, that would make sense. Yeah. My other reason for being surprised by that was the fact that not just the quality of, of airbrusher he is, but what we talked about in relation to that topic uh, in a previous episode was how efficient he is. And that seems like an extra step. And someone that's efficient right it surprises me that he would do that step and therefore it must have a lot of value for him to lose efficiency so did you do it did you try it out no okay i haven't yet but but you will soon i am going to okay and 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 if you watch videos like his this is back on topic kind of here you see the subtleties of how he does color mixing and how he integrates certain ratios of the previous color to get these blends to get a proper fade Mm -hmm. it's not just like all right the robe's going to be green and it's going to have you know it's going to be bright yellow as the highlight because he's in a bright sunny day he don't just go green and then yellow and it looks good it does not look good it Mm -hmm. looks like garbage okay and so there is a lot of science and trial and error to getting those blends with an airbrush that counteracts the notion that it's cheating if if we can just all do it then it's okay it's cheating but you can't do it i can't do it yeah how is that cheating no yet. Yeah. i think another thing about the airbrush is that a novice who might be using it there's always this there's this notion in 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 cinematography where it's like if someone can see what's going on if if you're watching a shot in a movie and you're like oh this is like a st-, if you're focusing on the fact that the shot is a steady cam operator shot and not what's going on in the movie you failed at some point so in, in the same vein with an airbrush if you're looking at a piece and you're like this was all airbrush blended you're not focusing on the piece as a whole you failed somewhere along the yeah. line so trying to hide 
the tools you used to get the results you got is kind of a, I think an important thing to think about because if all your stuff looks airbrushed, I think then you messed up somewhere yeah. along the way. And that's a legit thing. We see that all the time. All the time. Yeah. yeah. You're like, whoa, your airbrush job. Yeah. You know, I mean, you'll, it, you'll hear that on, you know, when people are jockeying at like painting competitions and stuff, it's like, oh, yeah. sweet airbrush work. If someone says to you sweet airbrush work, that's not a compliment. That is not a compliment. No. They're saying you're not good at hiding that you used an airbrush. Right. And, and you know, that's, you, you don't want to distract from what you want to convey. So if your technique is distracting from what your narrative of your piece is, you failed. So the the result of this conversation is that there are things that airbrush airbrushes accelerate at and there are things that paintbrushes accelerate at and being aware of when to begin using one and not using the not use the other i think is an important thing to kind of figure out it's not all one thing or all the other i think a healthy mixture is probably the right spot to be mhm and there are there are plenty of people that are really good airbrush artists in the mini painting community, but they're not good brush artists. Yeah. And you can see that um, in in their final quality of their work. Now, if you're a person that does a lot of commission work and you're really good at the airbrush, which you will be if you do that for long enough, you'll become really good at it and you'll be able to use your airbrush for tighter windows or tighter spaces yeah, a lot better than i can do you'll be a sniper yeah you'll be the <laughs> snipe it down in there um you get much better at that but oftentimes those folks don't spend as much time in the brush side because they're they're doing it for quantity right to make money and right it's their living they should do it that way so um yeah i i i also think i'm gonna switch gears here a little bit okay another reason why i think <laughs> we're gonna, gonna go in second Okay. Oh, this, this is if we're driving in your Honda boy. later to the oh, yeah. <laughs> some chicken tendies um, I think people say or either say airbrush is cheating or they, they'll they ask is that airbrush was that airbrushed is to put up a barrier in front of themselves that they can use as an excuse for not trying to get better or not be better yeah, well, there's this dangerous thing too, or it's like people can't afford airbrushes because it's more than just buying an airbrush. It's also buying a compressor and maybe buying fittings for it and, and the hose and stuff like that. And not only is it intimidating from a financial standpoint, but it's also intimidating just from a, a gear standpoint because it's like, I got to make sure all my fittings are the right uh, thread count and right inner and outer diameter and that they all fit and work. And it's just like a brush is so much more transparent or at least it seems more transparent, mm. right? Um, but an airbrush, it doesn't hide its transparency. It's like, yes, this is more, this is more techno techno this is more technological <laughs> the system is down <laughs> um but yeah there, there's more gear involved so it, yeah. it is at face value more complicated yeah and when when you're learning a uh the hobby and you're getting into it and you're there's already so much in this hobby that's overwhelming that what i need to be able to do to accomplish my task of having my little plastic men painted this is a whole nother kind of yeah. deep end of the pool. Right. And if I can say, oh, that looks so much better because it was airbrushed. I'm not there. I'm just going to try to do what I can do. It's it it sets yourself up more in a safety zone. Um, and I don't think people should get an airbrush to say they have one or to get one because it's going to make you a better painter right away. Um the number one reason I tell people to get an airbrush is so all of your stinking priming and even your base coats, we can all do that. And you're going to save so much money just, in the course yeah. of one year. The base coat, yeah. I mean, your primer. Let's just think of how much it costs for that Citadel rattle can of primer. Oh, you're saying it saves you money. It saves you money. I thought you were saying it saves you time. Oh, it also saves you a buttload of time. Not really. Uh, an aerosol can for both base coating and priming is faster because there's no cleanup. Yeah, well, but it costs more. It That's costs true. more. Yeah. So I bought this Badger 
I think it's 32 fluid ounces mm-hmm. or 16. I can't remember of primer and Steinal res Steinal res. It's going to last forever. Yeah. <laughs> and it costs 40 bucks and a can of Citadel black primer costs what? 13, 13. I Might be more. more than that. That was like sixteen. Yeah. Okay. Ah, yeah. That's ridiculous. Yeah, that kind of runs out pretty fast. And part of the reason is is because the the spray pattern of the can is wider, and so a lot of the primer may not get onto the model itself. And with an airbrush, you can kind of direct most of the air primer right onto the miniature. Um, but you know, I feel like we're kind of splitting hairs right now. Yeah. Because maybe sixteen bucks to someone who's paying fifty or 40 for a box of five dudes is kind of insignificant. Yeah. That's where we get back to the the point of it being expensive. And I'm like, eh, what hobby are you in? Yeah. You know, uh, you can go right now to Harbor Freight. I don't know if this is a store that people have everywhere, but Harbor Freight is like this hardware kind of tool store. Mm-hmm. And you can get stuff super cheap. Super cheap. Some, I, some things are a good deal to buy. Some things maybe you should Yeah, avoid. you'll learn quickly what's good and what's not good to buy there. Oh, right. Okay. So they have a set. I don't know if they still carry it, but they did a while ago that I purchased that is $70. And it comes with the compressor, the hose. Like a serious compressor. Yeah. And okay. I use the same compressor I use today. It doesn't have the tank on it, but I don't give a crap about that. Wait, you use like a... No, no, I don't use like the tire. I'm not talking about like a tire compressor. Oh, like a pancake compressor? No, not a pancake. Is it like my size? Yes, it's that, but it doesn't have the black thing underneath. It's just the top part. Harbor Freight sells that? Yeah. Okay, so the kind of compressor we're talking about is not like a a pancake compressor that you would like drive a nail gun with. Right. It's like a a hobbyist compressor. It's like a smaller... Okay, go on. Yeah. And so they have they have the compressor, the hose, an airbrush. Seriously? Yeah. An airbrush and all the, the fittings and toolings and the airbrush clean, cleaner, little pipe cleaner things, all that. Sixty nine dollars and ninety five cents. That's pretty amazing. Or you can just buy the compressor there, which is what I did, for forty bucks. That's pretty sick. That's more expensive than the master's compressor. But then again, it has a tank. Yeah. But whatever. Um, okay. So I, I think the the price point thing is also either people just are putting that up as a barrier or they haven't done a little bit of looking to see what they need. Because you can go out there and buy an Iwata airbrush compressor for like $350. Oh no, no, no. no. The, and it's like, I don't understand why airbrush companies think they can charge exorbitant prices for compressors. I don't understand the value add that they have. Like, what am I going to get when I get a better compressor? People might say, well, you get less moisture in your line. It's like these things come with moisture traps on them. Yeah. And even if I, I occasionally check that thing for moisture, it has a little release valve on it. Mm-hmm. There's never anything in it. It's yeah. always dry as a bone in there. Yeah. So do you know what, what's the reason people buy fancy compressors? I don't think they do. Maybe they, they got it because they, they make them. People do. Because it's, I think it's got to be mostly ignorance, right? <laughs> And I don't mean that I in like, like a, if d- Ken Badger, Ken Schofield, the owner of Badger <laughs> Airbrushes was like here right now, you'd like fucking slap us. Yeah. Head. I, I, you know, I mean, maybe some people value it more than we do, but okay. to each his own. But I think some people don't understand that you can have accomplish 80% of what you want to accomplish for a reasonable amount of money. Right. So we can speak from an area that we know so far our cheap compressors have delivered every bit of performance that we expect them Mm -hmm. to. And maybe if we were Angel Geraldes or Angel Geraldes, uh, we would, uh, we would see a difference in the compressor, but we're not there yet in neither are you, (laughs) frankly. (laughs) So just buy a cheap compressor because it'll do everything you need it to do. Oh, another, uh, gosh, Harbor Freight needs to give me some free Harbor bucks for this. But um, (laughs) also you can buy, if you get one through them, through Harbor Freight, buy the extended warranty. It's $5 for five years. That's And I busted mine already, which was my own fault. You dropped it? No, I kept twisting the the moisture trap because I didn't feel like it was on correctly until I snapped it off. Oh no. (laughs) And I'm like, yeah, uh, this thing is broken. <laughs> like eight months later. And they're like, cool, go grab another one. They do not care. That's awesome. Yeah. So 
Um, my thing has been surprisingly tough. So I've used it to, to actually power a nail gun. The gauge on there says 120 PSI, but it really never gets higher than 50. Mm. Um, but I put it on top of my workbench um, and the vibration sent it off of the workbench. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> and it, it fell. But it still works. What? Um, so it's I'm happy with it. Wow. It works pretty well. Um, but let's answer the question here, John. Is is airbrushing cheating? Ya or nine? <laughs> it's no good. Yeah. No, it's not cheating. It's not cheating. It's not cheating it's at not all. It's not cheating. Get over yourself. Yeah. It is it is absolutely not cheating. And if you think it's cheating. You're salty. Come over, <laughs> come over my house. Show me how you can paint something with it and it looks good. And then you'll yeah. see it's not quite so simple. And here, here's another point I want to make. Um, we said earlier that, you know, it's, it's good to have a mixture. Um, and I want to make this claim. Everything an airbrush can do, a paintbrush can do with infinite time. Mm. Everything a paintbrush can do, an airbrush can't do. Do you agree with this? I like that so it's statement. Like, yeah, it's like even if you think airbrushing is cheating, you have the superior tool already because a paintbrush has more fine control than an airbrush will ever have and can achieve what an airbrush can. Debatably better. You have opposable thumbs. Where are you going with this? Like dogs don't have opposable thumbs. Yeah, dogs can walk down the street just like you can walk down the street, but they don't have opposable thumbs to write their names. The paintbrush is the opposable thumbs oh, in oh, this oh, scenario. Okay, okay, okay. You're saying that dogs shouldn't say that opposable thumbs are cheating. Right. If they could talk. I don't know. Uh, I think this analogy is crashing. It running. is terrible. <laughs> it's, it's I liked terrible. it. I liked it. Um, yeah. But yeah, so I think we should get specific here. We keep saying... Airbrushes are good for certain things. Paintbrushes are good for certain things. And what are those certain things? And, and I'll k- kick us off here because I asked the question. I find that uh, when I need to get a, a blend in a constricted area, uh, a paintbrush is impossible to use because I'm going to get overspray all over the miniature. So having the ability to get a blend, say, on like an individual flame on like, I don't know, some some chariot that has like goblets of fire it's incredibly handy with with a paintbrush because I can get in there, I can get my blend, and I don't I don't disturb any of the other areas. Mm-hmm. Um, we discussed earlier how an airbrush excels blending large areas like armor panels or or other things uh, on 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 miniatures like like large scale miniatures, for instance. And I wanted to bring this up actually. I, I want to answer that question more, but there was an entry in Crystal Brush, I think two years ago by Rafael Apica. It was a uh, he took a bust he made and made a full figure out of it. It's called Son of Corn. Remember this? Oh, yeah, I remember that. And uh, he wrote an article on how he painted it. And he did this interesting thing where he did these very distinct layers of color with a paintbrush and then came in with an airbrush and blended the transition between the two. Have you ever done that before? I don't think so. Uh, yes, kind of. I kind of want to try it out just yeah. to see how it works. I did it. A, a, I, way I've done it before is doing basically a a monochrome black and white scheme. So you go from black all the way up to white and then you use airbrush or like shades or contrast paints. So it's, it's kind of the same thing. Okay. Yeah. Paints too, kind of same thing. To tint it. Yeah. To build it, blend it together. Okay. Yeah. But anyways, um, what are, if you can think of any uh, yeah. places where brushes excel or airbrushes excel? Okay. I, I mean, I think the number one thing to take away from this where airbrushes excel is they simply speed up the process of what you're trying to get, do in the initial steps. Mm-hmm. So getting the the base coats. If your dude is 90% power armor, you can airbrush 90% that many to 90% done to a really high standard so much quicker. Yeah, yeah. So if it's just if the dude is the ma- is majority one color, yeah, and you want to have him lit zenithally, there is no other tool. The airbrush is the tool for that job. Yep, absolutely. So it's it's quicker with that. Um, the paintbrush, if you if you want the true specular highlights, true l- sharp line highlights, you want color that is exactly where you want it paintbrush is really your only option mm-hmm. uh, i mean technically you could mask off 
everything every time you do that. Oh, that would just that would be such a strain to do that. For a tiny, tiny plastic figure. It's just not realistic. So No, it no. isn't. What what else? Do we have any other I mean I'm kind of throwing some wide swaths there, but I think it's pretty straightforward. Swaths? I don't know. It's a word. Can we get a dictionary look up on the word swaths? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I can't tell you what it means. <laughs> I just feel like that's what jo- Jackson Pollock did when he made his paintings. He just cast wide swaths. Yes. I, I think strokes maybe. Wide strokes. It's not a stroke if the paintbrush never hit the Stroking. canvas. It was a swath. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We'll add the dictionary. It's not there. Swaths. <laughs> um, all right. Is there anything else that we want to just be upfront and honest of? What else does the airbrush? Oh, I got one. Here's something else the airbrush sucks at. All the foreplay and the cleanup. Oh, yeah. Jeez Louise. And it's more than just you use the airbrush and you rinse it out. Like the one I use, which is the HPCS, has this uncleanable area seemingly, mm-hmm. which is like right back up where the needle comes from. A primer and paint will get in there and it's impossible to get out even with back blowing and doing other things. You need to remove the needle yeah. and then rinse water through like the stem of the airbrush and flush it out. Because if you don't, it would create a little ring seal that hardens it and makes it so the next time you go to use the, the airbrush, you pull back on the trigger and the needle doesn't move because it's like fossilized Crust, and crusted. Yeah. Right. So yeah, the the freaking the management is <laughs> the upkeep is so, so annoying with an airbrush. And that's the number one reason why you see people like Ben Comets and Traverian that don't basically ever or almost never use an airbrush. Because it is, they say, it is not worth it yeah. for what I say for the heartache that I got to go through. Right. And yeah. I totally feel that. Yeah. Uh, side tip is, okay, raise your hand in the audience. If ever the, the times where your airbrush is broken or something is wrong with it is when you're just starting <laughs> to paint and not like after I've been doing it for an hour. I'm raising my hand yeah. right now. It's because you didn't adequately clean it the last time you used it, right? It sure felt like I did. I, I have learned my lesson where when you want to start airbrushing put water in just to see if it works because <laughs> if you get you get all this paint in there it's all nice and blended and thin and you go to pull the trigger and it's like it's not f-ing working yeah. i just swore dang it i'm yeah. sorry oh yeah I it's not only three though i think it i think you're at one and i'm at two yeah oh i'm at two so okay we're at four that too um so yeah it's like you gotta you gotta first i mean not don't even don't even put water in just see if you can pull the trigger back and the <laughs> right. needle isn't stuck yeah. um yeah it's it's a pain but yeah definitely that I, is definitely me what you just described okay all right i'm glad i'm not alone in that because <laughs> sometimes something about like i'd be all right if i've been airbrushing for an hour and a half and it's like yeah i probably should have been cleaning it better between color changes this is my own fault but it's like oh man i'm all done with this full session clean it all up smooth as a you know everything going through and cleaning out the the cleaner is coming through clean on the other side, put it away. Everything's great. Come back two days later. And it's like broken, <laughs> <laughs> broken. Um, yeah. Also airbrushes are just like, they seem, I guess, and if you don't have a setup for them, they're just super messy. Cause mm-hmm. like, uh, you know, somewhere in the course of, spraying the model or cleaning your airbrush or uh, swapping paints or mixing paint in the cup. I just seem to get paint everywhere and I freaking blow through paper towels. Holy cow. Yeah. They um, are a messy, messy girl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's another kind of inconvenience. Um, I use a, one of those cheap, cheap ish uh, Amazon buys of the airbrush little booth collapsible booth okay yeah but i just keep it in my basement on a card table and it's it's not like portable they market it as portable but i never have taken it down to put it up right if i didn't have that i can't imagine how much paint spray would be like all over my house i mean if you look at my computer monitors there is paint spray all over them yeah um i've had this idea for a while where it's like a portable airbrush platform where it's like you have this Essentially, it's a suitcase that doesn't open. 
but inside the suitcase there are like 420 millimeter cpu or sorry computer fans mm -hmm. and it, it's got a handle it's attached to your desk either magnetically or on like pegs and you pull it off and you put it down and it could have like maybe some walls that would fold up if you wanted that or not but you flick the switch and turn it on and the switch turns on the compressor and the fans for the little little booth and then you just kind of just aim it generally toward your platform but it sucks it through the platform and then through like a hepa filter mm -hmm. um and then when you're done you can just pull it off and then just stick it to your desk and you're done um but i've kind of thought about having like a little I call, you call it an airbrush platform you can make that mdf really easily you should take this to shark tank oh yeah yeah i think they would buy this they're like who is this for like seven nerds <laughs> <laughs> you're not gonna sell enough get out of here <laughs> i like that idea though because that's like this the one that i have is all it is is two fairly decent sized computer fans <laughs> it's all it is right okay so maybe, maybe it isn't as revolutionary as i as i thought uh, it your was. system's more interesting and complex than the standard ones out there but yeah so yeah it, it's just the extra space and the fact that you got to in theory deal with ventilation unless you also want like hand cancer and yeah. lung cancer right yeah i don't really ever ventilate if i know i'm going to airbrush for like a couple hours not not even like an hour or more i'll, I'll toss on a mask mm -hmm. but I don't know. You really, yeah, I've never done that. <laughs> <laughs> Have um, you ever noticed anything? Someone told me one time where if I, someone told me that like, if I airbrush for an extended period of time, I noticed that my eyes start to dry out a little bit and get watery. And I can kind of see that if you're like thinning with like an ammonia based thinner, like an isopropyl alcohol or something like that. And it gets in the air. It'll, it'll dry out your skin. It'll dry out yeah. uh, your eyes a little bit. Has that ever happened to you? No. No? Okay. It's happening right now though because you mentioned having dry eyes. So now suddenly I feel like my eyes are dry. <laughs> <laughs> Blink a thousand times. Yeah. The flip side of this is people say that the uh, airbrush is great because it allows me to prime in the winter, Scott. Oh, Jesus. Because you can't prime with aerosol cans outside in the winter. That is a proven fact. Okay, let me just say something here. <laughs> okay, so like, yeah, I, I'm the guy that rages about people saying stupid crap on YouTube. Uh, but I want to just add a caveat here about aerosol cans. On the back, they say they're ideal conditions they work in. And those have been tested by like chemists and like product testers that are much smarter and better at their job than I am. That That's just the optimal temperature and condition they work in and you should follow them. But that doesn't mean that they also don't work in other conditions well enough for our tiny miniature hobby. Now, that being said, there are products in aerosol cans that will totally break down in cold weather. They'll either never cure and be glossy and sticky I've seen examples of people who have primed in the winter and like their primer looks like freaking crackle medium. So, Sweet. so your mileage may vary is the, is the key phrase here <laughs> for every aerosol can I've tested. They all work. They cure fine. As long as you bring it inside when you're done priming um, and they work. But you know, if you buy like, some five dollar can of primer from the closest convenience store and it's like it's having problems don't come crying to me okay oh <laughs> uh, okay i just wanted to poke you on that and see what <laughs> see what happened <laughs> see what happened yeah but you're like you're it's 70 degrees in your house you shake the sucker for two minutes right we're not going outside at 30 below and shaking it for two minutes right. we're shaking it all up inside all i inside. got my mini in my hand i got it pre-shaken i take two steps outside i psh, 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 I walk back inside. Yep. Not much has happened in that equation where you could have problems. Right. So one of my friends actually tests aircraft paint um, on aircrafts and stuff like that. And he was like, the big problems come from when there's a temperature differential. Mm -hmm. So if the paint you're applying is different than the surface you're applying it to, then you're going to get problems. You're going to get condensation and then condensation causes issues. So as long as your miniature and your can are both room temp, you're golden and you're not outside long enough to change that much. Um, if you were like priming like 20 dudes, you, that there'd probably be an issue there. But yeah. like one guy, easy. Yeah. Uh, what you don't do is you don't say, well, hey, you know what? I am uh, not going to go outside in the winter and, and prime these guys. I'm just going to do it in my basement. 
Don't ever do that because your, your wife will murder you. She'll come home and she'll be like, why does it smell like <laughs> toxins in this house? And it did for a day and a half. Yes. And now she won't let me do anything that comes out of an aerosol <laughs> can in the house. So keep your wife happy. Yeah. And buy an airbrush. <laughs> right. That's okay. the moral of the story here. Did we did we beat this horse, this airbrush horse enough? Do you want to kick it a couple more times? I think we did. Airbrushing isn't cheating. It excels in certain areas that the paintbrush doesn't. But at the end of the day, the paintbrush is the ultimate tool. Yeah. And I, I think that it's all about educating yourself. The the wives' tales that you're hearing about on, on airbrush are often around miseducation or ignorance on what it is and what it isn't. And if you learn more about it, you'll be more confident in it. You'll be able to have it aid you as what it is, a tool, not a magic wand. Yeah, because it is certainly is not a magic wand. <laughs> it, no. There is a learning curve. Yep. All right. So let's do we talk about some newsy news. Let's talk about some newsy news. I think uh, we wanted to do like we want to do get some like someday we're gonna have some audio like news. Yeah, well yeah. We don't want to copy John Cena. All right. I was singing that song, so that's partially my fault. So um, in my head. Right. But yeah, some sick news jingle. If you got a sick news jingle, send us the jingle in the email in the show notes. That's news at trappedunderplastic.com. Ooh. Give yeah. us your best jingle and we'll use it. Yeah. We need news. We need hot topic of the day, which is our main topic. No, we need what we painted. I think just the news segment having the jingle is fine. Because oh. then it gets a little redundant, doesn't it? But they're they're a different jingle with like a different genre. Like we've got reggae for the news segment. <laughs> we've got like 1960s country western <laughs> for what we painted. And then we got hip hop. Yeah. For the top, no. Um, but yeah, the news. We're going to talk about two things. Uh, recently, uh, Nova Open and Reaper Con, Dragon Con. They all kind of occur in the same week and then have We want to talk about that. Yeah. And then uh, someone else of miniature painting fame has joined the uh, online content creation fold. You want to talk about them too. Where do you want to start? Um, I think we talk about Monsieur Latham first. All right. So Darren Latham, who is, I want to tell you a story about Darren Latham. Um, so Darren Latham added me on Facebook or I added him on Facebook. I probably added him on Facebook. Let's get, let's get real. Darren Latham is the lead miniature designer for games workshop. Yeah. Okay. He's, He's the head honcho. It's kind he, of a big deal. He used to be an heavy metal painter, one of the like one of the top dogs there, and now he's he's the lead miniature designer. Um, uh, I'm his friend on Facebook, and you know we were chatting. He 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 sometimes hit me up after I paint like a space marine and make a funny video about it. Like he watched our space marine skit, and he, he thought that was funny. And I was like, oh sweet. I was like, because <laughs> that could have really gone the yeah, other way. Yeah, <laughs> that could have gone the other way. Um, <laughs> But every once in a while, he'll, he'll you know he'll, he'll chat with me. Um, and uh, recently, we were talking, and uh, we were talking about future videos. And I was like, you know, when are you gonna re-release what else? And you know, he's funny. But he said a phrase that get, made me half chub. And he's like, my friends call me Daz. And I was like, am I your friend? <laughs> and I like almost cried. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, I understand. When I was a, a wee lad, a yeah, wee laddie, I grew up reading white dwarf and looking at the instructionals in white dwarf and mm -hmm. um i'd watch his 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 step by steps and uh you know he had these awesome ones where he painted non-metallic metal gold sanguineous like the of the blood angel character and i followed them and i loved them and darren latham was like the dude he was my favorite painter on the heavy metal team so for him to call me a friend at this stage in my life that's pretty sweet it makes me happy it makes it makes my nerd inner self very happy we're like that's like one step closer to us see i'm gonna i'm gonna put us in this so i get to ride on the coattails here <laughs> getting a behind the scenes full gw like plant tour yeah oh my god i would love that we need to like have our cameras and take like touristy pictures i would i would love to tour the gw facility in nottingham and do like a, a i want to i want a hard hat on yeah <laughs> Just <laughs> walking around, acting official, right? <laughs> well, you're like Jim. How's the how's the line going? <laughs> We're all right, boss. <laughs> all right, oh, keep up then. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we've already proved in several videos that we we're bad at doing English accents. Yeah, please, we could figure, please withhold. Thing, yeah, but if we spend enough time over there, we'll just develop it naturally. Okay. Yeah. 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 
Yeah, that that kind of thing comes after years of immersion. Well, it's a big plant. Okay, There's a lot of tours. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, out of the actual news, Darren Darren Latham <laughs> has started to make videos for both Instagram and YouTube, and I'm not sure if he had he already was making videos, and he just decided to officially announce it. Because when I went to go check his channel it seemed like he had like 10 or 12 videos already on it. And I was like, geez, like you're pumping these things out. But uh, his videos are like incredibly specific. Um, so like they're great if you're in need of a very specific thing from someone who, you know, paints debatably. I think he's like the creator almost, or one of the creators of like what is understood as, as the heavy metal style. Mm -hmm. So if you're like, so from someone who is very much so in the know, if you want an inside look at into how to paint power cables, there is a, a video <laughs> series <laughs> more than one about how to do that. And I'm saying you're, you're hearing that right series. There's part one and part two. Um, so yeah, like there it, it deep dives and it's from someone who is, you know, in the know, very much so. Yeah. Um, they're, they come across to me as very much uh, shoot it on my phone quick, get slap it on the internet kind of style. I'm not yeah. saying the quality is terrible, but it's... Right. No, yeah, that's what it is. Oftentimes, I'm like, I feel like I wish you were zoomed in twice as much. Like, <laughs> you're, you're taking up one quarter of the, the frame when you're painting a cable. And I'm like, I can't really see very well. Right. Yeah. So it's very much so the impression you get is that he's making it as a service to the miniature community. Yeah. And there's no, there's no inner like like motivation or impetus for him to make higher quality videos because it's yeah. for the betterment of other people. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, so yeah. He's like, God damn, Duncan ain't pulling his weight. I got to start making my own videos. <laughs> <laughs> Duncan. What are you doing, guy? Oh. Hey, Editorial Scott jumping in here. They're broken into multiple parts because Instagram only allows for 10-minute videos. On YouTube, his videos are not broken into multiple parts. All right, back to the main podcast. Okay. So that happened and his stuff will be linked in the show notes if you want to check it out and, and kind of get some insight into Darren's process as to how he paints. Uh, but the next thing that happened is at the time of recording this, uh, Nova Open, Reaper Con, and Dragon Con, which isn't necessarily like a miniature hobby convention, all just happened this past weekend. And, you know, the first question we ask is Reaper and Nova can't you guys have your convention on a different weekend? <laughs> just get along. Yeah. What yeah. the heck? Just get along. Yeah. I don't know if they look at what they do is so different that they feel like it doesn't, there isn't an overlap, but that's the wrong answer. Yeah. <laughs> if that's what they're saying. Right. Um, but maybe it's just an overlap from the painting side. Maybe our segment is the only thing that there's the overlap from. Because ReaperCon is is more based on role playing games. It is. Yeah, because that's what all Reaper minis are used for for D and D and stuff. No, oh, I guess so. Yeah, you're right. I guess I would have never considered what else ReaperCon would be about other than painting miniatures. Because like the Reaper paint and take at Adepticon has nothing to do with D and D. It has. Sure. It's just it's just about painting. It's about painting. Yeah. So is the convention? What you say is how does it break down? What's the percentage? Is it mostly about painting or mostly about D and D or is it half and half? I would say it's probably some, it's a stew, a mixed stew of both where it's really hard to know wh okay. which is, which is which. Okay. I know they have a fair number of painting classes there. It's a pretty. Who's teaching classes there this year? Do you know? A-Rod. A-Rod. Otherwise known by everyone else as Anthony Rodriguez or Pirate Monkey Painting. Pirate Monkey Painting. And uh, A-Rod -A did quite well in the, the Reaper Con painting um thing yeah this year yeah he deserves it a rod is the nicest dude he is um i talk to him every year i go to adepticon that's the only convention that i go to um because you know flying on airplanes everywhere costs a lot of money um and we can drive to adepticon we live up in a great white north the great great white <laughs> north yet yeah. it's hard for us to get to places yeah we gotta fly everywhere <laughs> Yeah, I don't trust dumb airplanes. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Anthony is he's great. He's always nice to talk to. And he has a very painterly approach to painting miniatures, very much so influenced by Alfonso Herraldez. Um He actually, just to kind of go on a little bit of a, a, a detour here, uh, he had this thing before he got married where he traveled Europe by bike, 
with his minis and stayed with various painters in Europe. <laughs> Sounds like an awesome experience. It, yeah, I, um, I'm so, sure it was. Yeah, he visited, you know, Spain and he was in the United Kingdom and staying with various people. He was on a bike people. the whole way? Yeah, he biked the whole thing. You should ask him about it. <laughs> oh it, my gosh. It's, it's a super cool I knew cool he went story. there. I didn't know that part of it. Imagine if he had like a camera and he made like a sick documentary and uh, like interviewed each painter. Like that would have been sick. I it, just want to see the Indiana Jones map shot of the little red <laughs> thing going across. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where and, he was. And it cuts to him on his bicycle like pb herman <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> so yeah that that was a cool thing he did um yeah but we've i mean I, i'm speaking for myself here i've never been to reapercon or 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 nova have you been to either of those no no i've only the only reason i've ever been to any convention is because you you said hey you let's go this. to a convention and i'm like sweet let's do it and it was the best thing ever it was the best I, i'm not gonna say it's one of the best things in my life yes <laughs> yeah it's one of the most fun times of the year because you can just like just cut loose yeah. and just be a super giant geek for four days straight. Yeah. and there's always people and you like walk around and you're like okay i don't feel bad because that guy's way nerdier than me <laughs> <laughs> no shame no, no shame. shame uh and what the the scary part about that is is like it gets me a little bit like the first taste a little bit of addiction i'm like i want to go to every single one yeah so do i i know but i'm just like the logistics of all that Hi, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So there was there was Reaper Con. Um, the the one thing I want to talk about Dragon Con is the crap that we just found out about. And hopefully by the time this episode's released, this is all resolved. But they have a painting competition at Dragon Con. Mm-hmm. Um, and somebody stole the first place and second place minis. I don't know how that how that happened. I that's so like. I feel like the way this happened was someone went up to the painting f- display case and was like, those two are mine. Can I have them back? And the person, the poor volunteer yeah. at the table was, you know, just either wasn't like, they didn't have the confidence to question that person and just gave it to them. Um, or worse, they're in an area where you can just easily take them. I saw yeah. pictures of, Oh no, maybe it wasn't. I saw ReaperCon. All the entries were just, on open tables i know i was like what someone's gonna get stolen but uh, nothing did apparently but at dragon con it did i I don't know if they have a similar setup i don't understand that on i see that all the time from um painting competitions in europe they're just like on tables yeah and i'm like first of all the the lighting is 30 feet above us in this ballroom and you you have the rope lined off so people don't take them so i can't even see how cool they are right it just feels like all it takes is someone like to drop their like shamrock shake up on there. <laughs> <laughs> I just think of what terror that could be. Yeah. Let alone someone stealing the stuff. Right. Maybe it's a cost thing to have all those display cases would cost a lot, I guess. I don't know. A good buddy Peter at Creature Caster figured it out year one. He did figure it out year one. They figure out a lot year one. Yeah. They did. A lot of good stuff. All right, so I want to talk about that because that's relation to our our hobby is this craziness of some thievery going on. Yeah, we also talked about how maybe it was just some old man, <laughs> yeah, who didn't understand how this worked. Because he, he's not online on Facebook. He does, he's not aware of like how much he's being lambasted for stealing these things. He's just like, oh, these are nice. Can I have these? <laughs> well, the, I think the impetus of this joke is that on the the Facebook post that's going around for them being stolen is it says. If you have any information, please contact the Dragon Con paint and take people. I'm like, well, maybe this old guy just thought paint and tank means you get to tank one of the painted things. Yes. <laughs> he just took it. He just misunderstood the, t- understood the title of, of the thing. Yeah. It's like, yeah, I'll take this shirt. You're right. Well, that one looks nice. pretty good. I'll take that one. <laughs> it sounded like it happened from overnight between like sometime between 10 p.m. and Saturday oh, yeah. and 7 a.m. on Sunday. Yeah. Get my inspector goggles on. Right. So yeah, open Nova Open being the last of the three that occurred has a uh, a painting tournament called Capital Palette, and in between the brief void that was Crystal Brush going away and Golden Demon showing it up, Capital Palette was probably the most prestigious painting competition in North America for that brief two days. <laughs> Would you say, would you agree with me? Just such a short window. Right, right. 
Well, yeah. yeah, I mean, Golden Demon has uh, prestige. It's been around for a long time, so it has a little bit more of a name developed for it than uh, mm-hmm. Capital Palette. But Capital Palette, nonetheless, has uh, had some really nice miniatures there as well. Yeah, and they have a tier system, right? They have uh, novice. I, th- I can't. I don't know if I'm doing this right. Journeyman, novice, journeyman, master. It, journeyman isn't novice. I don't know because journeyman in a trade is the first level. So a journeyman blacksmith is the first thing. Okay, journeyman, then tradesman. <laughs> Whatever. There's three levels. We don't know what they are. Then master class. Master class. So yeah, um, I don't know how they measure you as a painter. I'm sure they have a system. I, I'm sure they don't. I, I don't know how the, the master one. So if like the novice one is you've not um, won, you've not placed in any other painting competition you can do this one and then the second tier is you've placed in any painting competition you can do this one and then the third one for master that's where i don't know i don't know if it's like you've got to like self-select or like you step in the middle of the ring in the gladiator arena <laughs> <laughs> i think it's a history thing i think if you've won something in a previous year they know you and, and you'll advance but i'm sure you could go to open nova nova open blah, and you could slip into the journeyman category and just slaughter everyone and no one would know until it was too late yeah until like you're kicking toddlers at the basketball court and dunking <laughs> on their heads i guess maybe they decide when they see the model i Which, don't know that's a slippery slope too because it's like you're judging me right here on the spot where i belong you can't judge me that's well that's dangerous because then then your consistency comes into question right yeah full transparency i'm sure the rules are 100 percent out there and we just haven't read them so we're just making it up how yeah, we think it works we're very unofficial <laughs> we're just guessing we're right. guessing like if we were to do it how would we do it and right. it's just like it's a game of twister and uh <laughs> Instead of colored dots, it's like different game pieces. We're gonna play basketball. Your shirts were skins. Let's go. <laughs> uh, and were, then, were any pieces from Capital Palette? Did you like any of them? Did you yeah. look through them? Yeah, I haven't looked through everything, but some stuff that's come through on Insta, I really like. The oh, crap, not Eric good. Swinson. Yes, Eric Swinson. I said a brain fart where I forgot his name. <laughs> um, Eric Swinson, who won Best in Show. Mm-hmm. with his green lady in the green forest green leaves mm-hmm. and he also got best uh bust yeah with his samurai weird th- guy right so um the both of these things will be linked in the description as well as eric swinson's instagram he's a phenomenal painter we both mm-hmm. met him at adepticon and he's great um the bust is from rocket robot or robot ro- robot robot rocket i can't remember which one's first miniatures is a new company they have they they've done mostly d- it's all display figures, mostly busts. I think they have one full figure. Um, it's got a lot going on. Yeah. It's got wings. It's got samurai multiple armor. swords. It's got like a weird jester face. Yeah. Um, Crazy there's, there's anime lot, hair. There's a lot to look at. But actually, you know what? The way he painted it unified it in a way that made it look less, less, less cluttered. Yeah. Is that, you agree with that or not? I think so. I think so. I think he brought a lot of the elements together with yeah. his decision making and color choice. Yes. So that was good. That was, you know, there people say sometimes when the paint job improves the sculpt. And I feel like most of the time when they say that they're talking about how someone added volumes to a certain part of the miniature mm. that were otherwise not there by painting in a certain way. But in this case, it was more about scheme selection. So that was good. And then the other thing he painted was that, that green lady you mentioned uh, that was a model by p3 i forget if it's called like their legendary line or it has like a name but the implication is that they're going to start releasing larger scale non-gaming display miniatures just for the sake of painting which actually if i think about this are there other gaming companies that do this um who did your the bust for your guild ball guy is that also Steamforge? That's Broken Toad. So it's a different company oh, licensing their IP. I was close. I was close. Yeah. That, that, so that, that, is, that is kind of an example of that, but done by a different company. Mm-hmm. I don't think there's another gaming company that's like, let's make a display version of our IP because we have cool IP. Yeah. And we want to show it off in a you know something larger than 32 millimeter scale. 
This isn't this isn't new territory for Privateer Press though, because they had their bust line. Oh, you're right. Yes, uh, Gorsha and other people that I can't, yeah, which I can't remember. Eric Swinson also painted one of those and brought yes. that to. It wasn't this last year because he had he had Wolverine, Old Man Logan for the bust category this last year, but I think it was the year before he entered that in, in uh, Adepticon. Yeah, crystal brush. Um, and then another person, just this is a shout out to one of one of my patrons on YouTube. He had a a Night Titan in there, it was an Ultramarine one, and it looked really nice. And I don't know how he did, but it was a cool one that I that I recognized when I was kind of perusing the the Flickr album. Um, by the way, the whole Flickr album for Capital Palette will also be in the show notes if you want to check out all those models and and kind of see the level of competition. And also just see a bunch of pretty stuff. Competition. Yeah, you got to shorten competition. It's too. Yeah, long. it's too many syllables in I there. I can't handle that. Um, our buddy, our buddy Jake, that we go to Adepticon with every year, placed. Yeah, applesauce. Yeah, applesauce minis, Jake. Hey, and our our new friend from Adepticon from this last year, Emily. She took home some some big, big old prizes too. She, yeah, she got gold in the in the uh, with her Titan. Yeah. I was like, damn, damn. So her stuff looks great too. So um, you can find her stuff on the Flickr account there too. Yeah. They're, they're all down there. Um, and a, that, another thing con related, if I may. You may. <laughs> you con artist. <laughs> Recently, the second round of hotel reservations for Adepticon came up. Oh, and, Lord. And I just want to tell a story because I think it's kind of funny. Okay. So the first round came up and we had someone who was getting their room for us who will remain nameless. Um, <laughs> okay. Probably, he didn't probably mess up. No. Uh, we missed the chance though on the, cause we we're going to be, we we're going to go there for four days. Yeah. And the first block that opens up for Adepticon in the Renaissance Schomburg hotel is for four day people, which is us. And he called like immediately or he didn't call he did the online thing yeah right at noon when it opened right at noon and didn't get it it was like gone immediately yep um which this is a thing that happens i didn't think it was going to happen to us because it it seemed like we had such an easy time last year right um but it happened to us so we missed the four day block so then another block opens up for i think it's two days um but you can also get four day reservations during this time too Mm -hmm. so uh we tried again same guy tried and he didn't get it and john was like someone should call and so i was like okay i'm taking matters into my own hands and so i called and i was like hey i need a room for adults 26th of march 29th of march two queen beds and she was like oh yeah i got something i was like holy crap you do and she was like yeah and i was like crap i don't have my wallet i don't know where it is it's lost um who does what man does keep his wallet in his pocket at a all man times? who has a wife trying to sabotage him <laughs> she put it in a suitcase okay i didn't find it amber if, if you're listening to this i love you but it's your fault <laughs> um so i was like i was like person who is doing the scheduling for us they have rooms available call right now he called they were gone literally i would say not more than two minutes later he called <laughs> they were gone they a yes someone took the took our room yeah so um it stinks that we don't have a room in the renaissance uh because that that's the best place to be uh we're trying to get a room there i'm not going to explain how we're trying to get a room there because i don't want other people to do what i'm doing (laughs) um just because i i want a freaking room i don't want anyone else to have one uh but yeah so that's kind of that's our situation with the Depticon right now. But if you're listening to this and you're like, oh crap, change of plans, I can't go to a Depticon and you've got a Schomburg room. Yeah, and you're canceling? Tell please, I would be forever indebted to you. Please tell us you're doing that and we will call <laughs> immediately and and just just scoop that up. We'll 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 take wonderful selfies in the room <laughs> and share them with you. <laughs> you probably don't want those selfies. <laughs> no, you probably don't. <laughs> four grown men in two queen size beds <laughs> <laughs> it was so awkward the first night oh yeah especially when john peed the bed <laughs> i did i don't know i still am not sure if that was pee or not i don't think it was i, I think, think he would we would have known it was like i like jumped in a swimming pool and then just got in bed yeah i was so soaking wet the next morning it's like you took a no bath idea how. and then got in the bed i don't know how it like if if it was pee it would have been just by his crotch but 
basically we woke up one day and John was surrounded by wet bedding everywhere. Yeah. His entire body. It was like he sweated a buttload <laughs> or like got in a bathtub and then while still soaking wet, got in bed. I don't understand it at all. Yeah. Well, it happened. Do we have any pictures of this? I don't think so. That's a shame. Oh no, I took one and sent it to Amber. Oh, so of, I, of like this giant pool of yeah. like a wet shaggy dog slept on right in the spot. <laughs> oh boy. Yeah. Well, if you want to be on the inside stories of all the Adepticon crusades, <laughs> I don't know. Make sure to listen to this podcast in March uh, sometime. Oh, Because we'll undoubtedly talk about it. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. All right, Sprudes and Spruettes, that is episode three in uh, the li- Libros. Is that books? Spanish for books? I have no idea. Books. That is episode three in the books. We appreciate you hanging out with us for this lengthy little endeavor today. Yeah. All right. We like it. Um, how you can support us should you choose to, first and foremost, let other nerds know that we exist. So yes. share uh the share the good word. The, the gospel of the Trapped Under Plastic podcast. Um, give us uh, a, a good review on an Apple podcast or whatever else so we can kind of get to the top of the, the ladder or an honest review. Good or honest. Can't be both. <laughs> <laughs> we know it sucks. <laughs> um, a, you know, we've got some sweet merch. Scotty Boy is repping a shirt there. So if you want to help us out and buy a shirt, um, or you can check out our Patreon page as well, linked below. Um, did I hit it all? Well, uh, one thing we do on the Patreon is we do an extended episode. So oh. if you need to hear more of this yeah. and this, I'm, I'm gesturing right out of John's face and my face, <laughs> uh, you can find a longer episode, oftentimes between 20 and 30 minutes longer on the Patreon page. So, yeah, I think this one was well over 30. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So if you're interested in that, uh, Check it out. All things linked in the show notes below. All right. And with that, we'll see you on the flippity flop.